The human immune system is an amazing coordinated system that's designed to defend its host from anything foreign and potentially dangerous, including every possible infectious disease. From the moment we're born until the day we die, we're exposed to potential pathogens. They're everywhere in the world around us, and they're constantly evolving new survival skills, new ways of getting into the host and multiplying there before they exit in search of a new host. In response to this, the immune system uses a combination of defense mechanisms to effectively protect the host without harming host tissues in the process. Over time, the immune system evolves to remember pathogens it's seen before and to become more effective in its ability to defend against those in the future. The health of every organ system depends on how successfully the immune system achieves this balance, so understanding the immune system is essential in all areas of medicine. To understand the importance of the immune system, we're going to look at the case of a boy who made medical history by surviving for 12 years without a functioning immune system. In the process, David Philip Vetter taught the medical world not only about his immune deficiency disorder, but also about the ethical dilemmas doctors can face when a temporary medical solution ends up becoming a permanent one. On September 21, 1971, David was delivered by cesarean section at the Texas Medical Center in Houston, and within seconds he was transferred into a sterile plastic bubble that would become his home for the next 12 years. David suffered from a rare genetic condition called Severe Combined Immunodeficiency, or SCID, that left him without a functioning immune system. The Vetters had lost their first son to an overwhelming infection that resulted from the same disorder. Because SCID is linked to the X chromosome, the Vetters knew there was a 50% chance their second son, David, would also have the disorder, but the prospect of a bone marrow transplant from David's sister, Catherine, offered hope. Catherine would have been a perfect match for bone marrow transplant in the Vetter's first son if he had survived long enough to undergo the procedure. So the family and physicians on David's team saw the potential for a cure if, in fact, David carried the faulty X chromosome. In a healthy human being, the bone marrow is the source of all immune cells. Stem cells that originate in the bone marrow go on to differentiate into the various types of white blood cells that are the key players in the two major arms of the immune system, innate and adaptive. A potential pathogen trying to gain access to a host first encounters the innate immune defenses. These are immune defenses that we're born with and they don't change much over time. Innate defenses include physical barriers like skin and mucous membranes that can protect the host from pathogen entry. Once the pathogen is inside the host, the cells of the innate immune system form an immediate but nonspecific first line of defense. Phagocytes, like macrophages, and complement proteins are the major defense mechanisms associated with the innate immune system. The first cells to respond to most infections are the phagocytes. Phagocytes detect the presence of potential pathogens in the body, engulf them, then destroy and digest them. They can then display protein fragments from the digested pathogens on their cell surface in order to show the cells of the adaptive immune system what's been encountered and engage adaptive cells in the defense. At sites of infection, chemical and protein messengers secreted by activated phagocytes can enhance blood flow and cause local blood vessels to become more permeable, allowing circulating white blood cells to leave the blood and migrate towards the site of infection. This increased permeability is also the cause of localized swelling that often occurs at the site of infection. The chemical messengers can also stimulate pain fibers to warn the host that an infection is underway. Complement consists of a family of proteins that are present in high concentrations in the blood and the tissues. Complement proteins recognize foreign molecules and tag them so they can be more easily recognized, eaten, and eliminated by phagocytes. Potential pathogens can also be coded and destroyed by complement proteins directly. 
circulating fragments of complement proteins also increase blood flow and recruit and activate cells of the innate and adaptive immune system to the site of infection. The adaptive immune system is the second major arm of the immune system, and it offers a slower but more specific kind of a protection to the host. The adaptive immune system is capable of evolving and developing memory when it's exposed to anything foreign. The major cells of the adaptive immune system are the B and T lymphocytes. B lymphocytes are the cells that make antibodies or immunoglobulins. These are proteins generated by the immune system that bind to specific pathogens. Initially, these antibodies are on the surface of the B cells where they act like receptors. When a B cell encounters the particular pathogen that binds to the antibody on its surface, the B cell becomes activated and begins to secrete some of that antibody into the blood in an effort to neutralize the pathogen. After interaction with the T cells, the B cell divides and matures into plasma cells that produce and secrete large amounts of antibody and memory cells that help the host respond more quickly and effectively if the same pathogen is encountered in the future. T lymphocytes can be activated by antigen-presenting cells that show them protein fragments of the invading pathogen. In response, the T cells begin to direct and regulate immune responses by providing instructions to B cells about how they should produce antibodies and by modulating how much of an immune response is made to a particular pathogen. In addition, T lymphocytes target cells of the body that have been infected with intracellular pathogens like viruses or fungi. In SCID, the adaptive immune cells, the T and sometimes also the B cells, are missing. Without regulation of the T cells and the antibody response of the B cells, the immune system cannot function. Three days after David Vetter was born, his diagnosis of SCID was confirmed, meaning that he would be just as susceptible to severe infections as his brother. Having lost one child to the disease less than a year before, David's mother was fearful of reaching into the bubble to touch David using the integrated rubber gloves that hung at regular intervals along the walls of the sterile chamber. She said in an interview, I felt if I could stay distant from him then if the worst happened, I could handle it better. So I was hesitant to reach into the glove and touch him, but once I did, I was hooked for life. She soon took on the challenges of caring for her baby boy, along with his team of physicians who were confident they could cure him. David's diapers, clothes, and food had to be sterilized and inserted into the bubble through a system of airlocks, but baby David appeared to be thriving and growing in the sterile environment. No one had anticipated that David's sister would not be a match for bone marrow transplant and that David would somehow become trapped in the bubble that had been built to temporarily protect him. As David grew, his awareness of his circumstances did too, and a story that had once held the promise of ending as a medical miracle slowly became an ethical nightmare. During his years in the isolator, many studies were performed on David's immune system. At the age of four, he was found trying to poke holes in the bubble, and doctors were forced to explain to him the very real risks that faced him if any microbes were allowed into the sterile environment. Psychologists who worked with David encouraged him to escape the bubble using his imagination, and his mother remembers taking many make-believe trips into outer space with David during those early years. Teachers delivered lessons through the plastic walls of the bubble, and David turned out to be an exceptionally bright boy. In 1975, engineers at NASA designed a spacesuit that would allow David to leave the hospital, but David was very anxious about being exposed to pathogens outside of his regular environment, so the suit was only worn six times. All of these worries and challenges of living inside the bubble took a toll on David's emotional state as he grew. The isolator was moved from the hospital to David's home when he was nine years old, and his mother remembers him watching other boys playing outside through a window in their home, and she noticed a downturn in her son. David became increasingly withdrawn. As the family's desperation grew in the years that followed, more research from Boston offered some hope. 
physicians there had managed to perform a successful bone marrow transplant using a non-matching donor. Though the procedure was still in its experimental stages, David, who was now 12 years old, received a bone marrow transplant from his sister. At first, the transplant appeared to have been successful, but then several weeks later, and still living inside the isolator, David spiked a fever and developed an intestinal hemorrhage. On February 22, 1984, David was removed from his sterile chamber and wheeled into a hospital room where his mother stroked his skin for the first and last time. Like many children who realize they're going to die, David wanted to know if it was going to hurt and if his loved ones would be there with him. Once he was reassured on those two counts, he courageously faced death as he had faced life and he passed away. David's autopsy showed that the bone marrow cells from his sister had contained dormant Epstein-Barr virus. Without a functioning immune system, the virus had spread rapidly, causing a lymphoma. This was the first evidence that viruses could directly cause cancer, and once again, David's life and incredible journey had provided new insights into the relationship between pathogens, the immune system, and the development of cancer, information that has impacted many lives. Thanks to the scientific contributions of this remarkable boy, today more than 90% of infants born with SCID are successfully treated with bone marrow transplants. Long-term sterile isolation is no longer offered as a treatment option for SCID.